All right, lock and load, you guys. Let's do it. You got you got notes. Oh come on! Oh, my God, I'm okay. talking to the greatest no. living director. I gotta. No, I gotta but come you see, you're supposed to be talking. Yeah, well, I also have some anecdotes about the weather. In case Excellent. Not. All right. Hey, come on, everybody, move on out. I feel. Whenever I'm on a set, I'm still yelling. I'm not directing this. <laughs> you could direct it. Let's Please. get a crane. Let's get a push. Boom. <laughs> First time I saw him was in uh, a Luca's film, uh, Call Me By Your Name. Yeah. And so, you know, and I, I'm a great admirer of Luca, and I love the picture. I always talk about um, performances, but they aren't really, they're like behavioral, where you don't see the acting. You know what I mean? Yes. And so um, I connected there, and I saw Dune, mm -hmm. you know, which I enjoyed, and I started to see a sense of rage, mm -hmm. you know. And then they said, they, Chanel asked me to do this spot for Bleu. Uh, which you had already done. I had done years ago. Right. Yeah. At the first one. They said they had this young gentleman named Timothy Chalamet, and I said, ah, that one I know. And we had some kind of a dinner and talk, mm -hmm. et cetera. We had a plan for the, I guess you call it a commercial. I don't know what it is. Story. It's like a little narrative. I, I feel that it's not evocative of other commercials and perfume commercials in a good way. In a good way, yeah. I think. It's somewhat different than that. And, and so it's a, it's a story in yeah. a way. Um, but how to break it through. You know, my latest film was over three hours. This, 60 seconds. And it's, oh, Marty, it's only, six, only 60 seconds. The thing about 60 seconds is it's harder. Condensed. Condensed, and every frame counts. Mm -hmm. Every frame. Mm -hmm. You know, I know we're talking digital, but there's still frames in digital. Mm -hmm. But I mean, one frame more, two frames, that's the way we're editing this thing. Add two frames, take away a frame. You know, juxtaposition of images, all this sort of thing. So it's not an, uh, a facile way of working. It's actually, I find these much more intense. Yeah. Um, and it's a, they're real um, workouts. More as challenging. As yeah, more way. challenging. Yeah. The narrative itself was about the film actor and being on the road. And um, uh, one of the things we referred to was the great uh, uh, short film by Federico Fellini. Toby Dammit. Toby Dammit, yeah. And right. I showed it to you. And uh, uh, I said, let's capture some of that feeling, you know? Uh, that's, that's one a, of my favorite interactions with you, as you said. You've seen Toby Dammit, right? And I thought, no. this Fellini, sh this <laughs> pure Fellini short. No, I haven't. But I quickly, quickly got onto it. With that, as an inspiration, we. we uh, came up with a story somehow. It developed into a kind of a story. And right. how that happened, I'm not quite sure. No, but it's, I, I'm so <laughs> grateful that it developed. But I love, I felt so honored that you brought, uh, because um, I just didn't feel like a commercial. And I guess the fear as an actor, that's why I was so excited that you agreed to do it too, is that you, know, you don't want to feel, you know, know. Uh, whatever, like a product. I know. This was a total dream, total short film. What I walked away with the most, we haven't even gotten a chance to speak about it, but I was just so shocked about how unprecious you were about setups and uh, how quickly we would fly. Not to say there wasn't enormous attention to detail. It was just so fascinating when filmmakers start out, and I've worked with a lot of young filmmakers that are enormously precious and maybe plotting sometimes. And here we were just like going, you know. Well, it was uh, planned beforehand. Yeah, to, to words, fly I, like that? Well, not to fly like that, but I was glad it flew. Yeah. But no, the, the shots were designed. Or at least, the, I like to call it like a philosophy of a shot. Mm -hmm. Should this be a moving shot at all? Right. Or should it be static? And if it's static, what the hell size are you in the frame? Right. Is it from the waist up? So or that was here? all yeah. basically planned. Yeah, I mean, I mean, then when you get into the, like uh, looking out the window and you see the... Uh, uh, the billboard? The billboard. I know you're going to walk towards camera, but where do you stop? Um, I didn't know there was a shot list, basically. I have it myself. Do you always sure. work like that, basically, or not? Well, back on features. Yes, back in the, when I started doing uh, my first films, I would draw everything. Wow, I that had, sounds time intensive. Yeah, well, it was by so, myself anyway. I was always by myself. So nobody wanted oh to be God, with me. That's nobody another, wanted. That's another story. That's, that's another. another story. I was always in a room by the myself. The taxi driver was literally there. Literally but, across the street. I designed the whole picture and drew all the pictures right across the street at the St. Regis Hotel in that out that window. I spent a lot of time doing that because. First of all, I like the idea of how to tell a story with pictures, right? But it also, because it was so low budget, mm -hmm. I had to really- Have a plan? Have a plan so that it could be changed. Had you had an experience where you didn't have a plan? 
that uh, yes that? later on I tried I tried okay. uh, another film but it I seem to work better with a plan. <laughs> I really do. It's like showing up memorized or showing up unmemorized. Yes, yes, yes. You probably exactly. don't deal with a lot of people that are unmemorized. No, so. it's true, but you know, memorize is one thing. Knowing it's another, right? Yeah. As long as you know yeah, exactly. it. As long as you exactly. know it. Well said. You know, you could start fooling around with stuff. And, yeah. But I tried a different experiment once and it didn't work for me. But over the years, the drawings became notes and little drawings in the margins of the of the script or let's say in Goodfellas that actually was put into the script. How so like shot shot lists? Or, or that the actors would go off of in some way or no? No, no, yeah. no. As long as I had actors who could if I had a specific shot I wanted to get, which was complicated, as long as uh, he or she would be able to behave uh, unencumbered in the frame. Mm -hmm. You know, if I'm asking them to look backwards and walk forwards at the same time, and uh, at, I found that to be a problem. Mm -hmm. Then I right. may have adjusted the shot. You follow? Right, right. Depend on what's more important, uh, their faces and what they're doing, or this particular move to the left or right. But it's amazing in After Hours and Goodfellas, there's shots sometimes that push in rapidly on someone, and they're doing yeah. something very natural behaviorally. Obviously, De Niro's one of the greatest ever, but you'll be, a camera's flying at him, and he's like yes, picking yeah. his teeth or something, yes, exactly. and then he's not yeah. disturbed. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, that's why I was so seriously inspired working with you is that it was so unprecious and the commercial is quick. It's really gripping. Everyone I've showed it to, the four or five people, whatever, they go, oh my God, this is like, this well, is well, fast, well, the, the, the thing is, the, the situation was perfect for yeah. that. Yeah. You know, if it was something else, yeah. like if you see Killers of the Flower Moon, yeah. as you saw, I mean, in certain cases, you just hold the camera. Don't move Right. It, you know? Now, I was shocked with Killers too, though. It's very engaging. I'm shocked only because of the, the runtime, but it's you're gripped the entire time. I, and that was a big gamble. It's amazing, uh, pacing wise, all those characters feel out of that era. Leo, most I of know, all. You I know, know. Well, I tell you, well, you know what it's like. You're yeah. in a place like that, you learn to live in it. Yeah. And you become part of it. Yeah. And I mean, yeah, it was a long shoot, but a lot of my pictures lately have been long. Right. That's why I wanted to do this. I wanted to change the style right away. Right. I had to freshen up. Right, right. I had right. to change it. Doesn't mean go faster. I had to think differently. Right. You know, to, to force myself to think differently. No, I loved it. It was lean, it was muscular, and it was like way more running gun than I ever would have yeah. thought. I wanted to be free and open. Yeah. It was constructed, as I say, yes. designed. Right. But. Yeah, but there's room to play. Yeah. That's what I loved. Um, from my perspective, sometimes direction can be really explicit. And then when something's really explicit, it's quite hard to get to. I can't you know? imagine how, how you do yeah, it. Yeah, because you kind of lose your mind, you know? But when some, And I felt you nudging, which is really the best, because yeah. if you're getting sort of gently... And then if you don't get there, I felt that too. If I was like, it's not going to work, fuck it, we're going to go do something else. Do you something know? else. Yeah. Well, because... But you see, the nature of this spot lent itself to that because of um, uh, the spontaneity of the show, let's say, or the backstage chaos, mm -hmm. you know? Look, being specific and blocking specifically, it's another way of artistic expression. Right. You know, and there are times when I have to do it. Right. You know, but this particular story didn't need that. Yes. You know, I, I think we, we, hit, we hit the uh, pacing right. Getting in the, the van was hard when we hit you with the camera. But so. that was used. That's what yeah, I, yeah, I, yeah, I, yeah. I was laughing the first time I saw this podcast. I thought, oh, yeah. wow, this is, again, unprecious. Is like, well, this works? Great. We're going we're gonna to throw it yeah, in. Yeah. 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 The thing is that it really hit nicely. I mean, not the camera. It was like, bang. <laughs> that makes and you then, think it was on purpose. No. Okay. And then suddenly you throw in the back of the car. You yeah. look up. And, yeah. You know, it kind of indicates to the audience that what you're going to see for the next minute, minute and a half, whatever it is, is something very different and special. Yeah. I shot a movie in New York seven years ago on the streets, whatever, and it was so wonderful to, to rap and then walk home. It feels more like a creative exercise, I guess. Well, the city has the, and they always use the cliche of the energy, but it does have the energy. Right. It right. simply does, because everybody's on top of each other. Right. I mean, look at it, all the buildings on top of each other. It's different from L.A. L.A. is spread out. You get the car. Back in 1971, when I learned to drive, I had to learn to drive out there. Mm -hmm. It was wonderful. It's made for cars. Yeah. You know, and you just turn the music up. Your, uh, your edge rots out there, though. Yeah, it tended to, but luckily I was able to do films like Taxi Driver and then right. mainly because they saw Mean Streets and they wanted De Niro and myself together on right. that film. But it was a different New York. Oh, that was the New York of, um, you know, uh, Ford to City, Drop Dead. We shot it in the summer of 76. It was the most, apparently the most... Violent? No. Well, violent, yes. But you see, for me, violence here is always the same. I, I, I grew up here. 
I, I'm always walking in the street a certain way, or I know not. That. Yeah, you're always checking your shoulder. <laughs> <laughs> so the thing about it is, no, I, I, I just know I could see a person coming down that may not, because I grew up downtown on the, in a rough Lower area, side, right? in the Lower East Side, when the Bowery was the Bowery, and right. it was pretty scary growing up as a kid. Right. But um, what had happened was that the city was going to go bankrupt, and they asked the, uh, from my long story short. Yeah. yeah, ask for federal and the Bronx is on fire insurance schemes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was uh, buildings were collapsing. Right. That was that famous uh, yeah. building that collapsed uh, that we put in vinyl. It was uh, th- apparently the lowest ebb that the city has ever been in. Was that was that mid when we were shooting it was a perfect, taxi driver. perfect cinematic background. Yeah, but for me it was normal. Right, I was used to that. Well, I grew up in Hell's Kitchen, um, and uh, Hell's Kitchen's changed a lot from when I was growing up. Because when I was growing up, it was still a little bit on the edge in the Port Authority bus terminal. And that the Port Authority's kept its edge by nature, I guess. Yeah, it has. But I mean, the rest of the neighborhood is much come more up dressed bit, up. Yeah. Come up a bit. But the Port Authority, was, uh, I used to use that a lot. I was living in New Jersey, actually, but in the mid-60s. It was very cheap to live in uh, Union City or Jersey right. City. And, and uh, coming in and out of that Port Authority bus terminal, what I saw in there yeah. in the 60s, my God, it was horrifying. Right. The only places I think probably in Alphabet City mm-hmm. still has a sense of uh, the old tenements that I yeah. grew up in. That's what was weird working on this commercial too, is is uh, it's not tropes, but so much of the iconicism of New York has stemmed from your work, so it's bizarre to all of a sudden be, you know. Well, the only thing it. is like when we when, when you're down in the, uh, in the street in Soho, that you're walking along at the end of yeah. the, uh, when I was growing up, that street is where you went to steal hubcaps. And now it's... Uh, and also other things. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah. not that I stole the hubcaps, yeah. but I was with guys, you know, kids. Now, it's like being in um, Provincetown, Connecticut, I guess. I never was there, but... It's fancy as hell. Yeah. Yeah. I love in Taxi Driver, having just watched it again, too. I feel like you see so many things about moody or people on the edge. And watching it again, the opening shots are like super beautiful and serene and the music's playing. And just it's not lecturing, the movie's not lecturing you and telling no, you. No, I just saw the city that way all the time. One of my favorite things in the city is the steam coming up out of the street. Mm-hmm. And so I had to have the car go through the steam. That opening shot, yeah. Yeah, I had to. And that was done on 22nd Street somewhere late at night. I, I, that was criticized at one point by certain snobby critics saying, and that's the level of the metaphor of the film, hell. You know, a cab Earth. is coming from hell. Mm-hmm. I said, no, that's New York. It's, it's, it's the just steam in the is. streets. It is what it is. And when you see things come through that steam that way, you could think of, if you want, you could think of the inferno. You could think of paradise. Right. You don't know. Right. You know, um, it's a beauty of the city late yeah. at night that way. Yeah. When you have just pipes of smoke coming up all the way up Second yeah. and Third Avenue. Oh, man. Yeah, absolutely you know? beautiful. And the red lights, the, the tail lights of the cars. It was always right. raining, too, that, that summer. But you guys got lucky. It was always raining. And it's finally, amazing. We were waiting for the rain, and we started to go two or three days over schedule, and they were really mad at us. The studio was screaming, and I got in a lot of trouble because they were going to pull the plug on the picture, and so I uh, said, oh, we're shooting in the rain, so it's not going to match. Well, we'll have to figure out how to, well, we better shoot fast then. <laughs> yeah, 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 get it done, get it done. I still go back to basics, you know, right. normal lens, long lens, wide angle lens. Right. And then from there, you could go infinite, right. you know. And so uh, movement or no movement, movement of the frame or movement of the camera in the frame because a pan is different from a track, right? right. So uh, I stay with those basics. And then if there are new things that, that could be implemented in there and using focal length in a certain mm-hmm. way, but I do find that um, after all these years uh, and with all the new technology, There are more choices, and it's kind of good in a way, Mm -hmm. except that more than two-thirds of those choices you don't need to make. Right, because you end up wasting time or something? It's wasting time. Yeah. Yeah. So it always goes down to the basic, the basic, as an actor and as a director. What do you want to say? Right. And what's in the way? Something's in the way. What the hell is it? Is it technology or is somebody, you know, in front of you and you're trying to do something and they're distracting you? It's, it's It's that simple. Right. And now with And there's a few filmmakers that have a command of both, right? Yes. Yeah. 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 And to not get sucked into just the cutting edge. Well, I think a lot of those filmmakers are recent, in a right? Because they, they grew up with the technology. I did right. not. It's another generation. Yeah. It's going to be interesting what you guys do. Well, that's why I'm, and I don't want to be cynical, and I, I don't want to take myself out of uh, being a member of my generation as I have in the past. But um, I just think uh, boredom is a good thing. And the way I was intensely bored growing up and had to read books, or if I could get my hands on a movie at my grandma's house, you cherish that movie. And with too much information, too much access, you, you know what I mean? You yeah. can't, you're not going to Yeah. Well, replicate. it was a similar thing that you're talking about, boredom, in a sense, because of, uh, 
In my case, when I was three years old, 1945, I contracted asthma, and uh, my parents were working class. They were not, they didn't have books in the house and that sort of thing. They would just take me to the movies a lot or let me eventually go by myself to the movies. And I had this little tiny area in the apartment before everybody came back from work. Wow. Then I started to learn how to read novels. And this priest was an a interesting guy, a Father Principe. He was the one who gave us Graham Greene and James Joyce. Hmm. And that's when we were about four, 13 or 14. Right. And I started to read. That was a whole issue. Right. You know. But I think... Uh, it, it was piecemeal in some way. Yeah. Yeah. But what happens is that it's the old take the horse to water, you know, and if the horse drinks... You know, so that yeah, I had I had a couple of people who were doing that for me, mm-hmm. and we were sustaining ourselves. We were continuing. We took advantage of those uh, suggestions and guidance, and it wasn't always friendly. These were tough guys. But they weren't telling you what to think or what was no. good. They were kind of giving well, you the g- keys in some way, giving you a basis of morality too. Right. And uh, somebody pointed out said like in uh, Killers of the Flower Moon or a number number of the films I made where the level of corruption is so deep because it's not the the, the society is not rooted in in morality or any kind of spirituality. That's mm-hmm. what human nature might be, that mm-hmm. without that guidance or without that even dialogue uh, between people about morality and spirituality, it becomes, it, it becomes pure corruption. Right. I mean, if I, you know, in the, in the, the movie, it, it, because the Native Americans don't understand the value of money, if I, you know, charge you a dollar for this glass of water, they pay it, and then they realize, you realize they don't really understand paper money or anything like that. Mm. They're rich, but they don't know why. Um, and they don't know they don't know what money is. So when they come in again, I'm going to say it's $10, and they pay it. Right. So I'm going to say next time $25. I'll keep 15 <laughs> Meantime, we're friends. We take care of each other. And I'm just, you know, like, you know, you got the money anyway. I, don't, I have to work for the money. You're not. Mm-hmm. I mean, but that's an interesting moral issue. Mm-hmm. If it's only a dollar, charge a dollar. And so that's the interesting thing about how we could become complicit in um, alt- absolutely genocide. Yeah, and a genocide not told about, really. No, I, no. I wasn't educated on it. But the movie's still very spiritual, though. Like, a lot, a, a, almost all your films. I think it is. I think yeah. it is. I think it There's is. a spiritual core to it. It's interesting how corruption just uh, infiltrates every aspect of your life, and you could learn to live with it mm-hmm. because you don't react against it. You don't speak up. That's what's so great about the Leo character in it. You know, without giving anything away, yeah, yeah, this yeah. guy's a complicated figure, to say the least. Yeah, but yeah. it's handled so delicately. You don't feel that you're taking him, uh, you know, you're not instructing the viewer how to feel either way. No, no, yeah. no, 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 not at all, not yeah. at all. Like uh, in the case of uh, Wolf of Wall Street, for example, I only learned the other day from uh, an interviewer who said, you're not aware of the war of Wolf of Wall Street? So I said, what are you talking about? So well, there was a big screening at Paramount, the picture, and the, for the critics in New York, apparently, I was told this, there were two camps. One camp that loved the picture and the other camp that was furious saying, I didn't take a moral stand on Jordan Belfort. Mm-hmm. And one of the critics from the other group that liked the picture said, do you really need Martin Scorsese to tell you that that's wrong? Right. Yeah, that's well said. That's well said. Yeah, that's well said. You really need yeah. him to tell yeah. you that's wrong? Well said. He knows it's wrong. Does that moralistic attitude bore you a little bit now, or no? Well, it's beyond boring, I think. Uh, you know, it's always been around. I mean, um, Well, because America's a Puritan country. Well, it says it is. Mm-hmm. <laughs> right. Well, that's what's confusing to me as a young person is uh, but there's how a much... But there's a difference between religion and spirituality. Okay. And religion could, could taken, the, taken the wrong way, could become something that is restricting mm-hmm. and becomes intolerable mm-hmm. and becomes judgmental. Uh, judgmental, sp- key word there, yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So you have a big problem. Good example is Killers of the Flower Moon. Yeah. <laughs> they were all Europeans who were Protestants. Right. You know, I'm not condemning Protestants. I'm just saying that was the... The, um, the moral code. They had a morality. Uh, but, you know, when a guy like Bill Hale, played by De Niro, who says, I love these Osage people, and he's killing them, but he does love them. Now, what is that? It's fantastic because you don't feel um, there's no music cue that made, that says no. this guy's evil. You no, know, no, it's, no, it's, it's, it's uh, he's just going to do what he's going to do. Uh, but that that's the uh, the thing I think uh, ultimately about concentration for younger people mm-hmm. and taking the time not just to make a movie to become famous. That's good too if you mm-hmm. can. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> but but I think ultimately if you have something to say, if you're really burning, and not just the party line. Yes, exactly. 
because they, the most they, important things are things that are new and fresh, point away forward, point to how people are yeah, feeling. Yeah. It's harder to know now. There's great, uh, there's less mainstreaming of things now. I think things are a little more. I was going to say the other night, we were at this big event. I had to, people were talking about uh, that the news is uh, different now and this and that. I said, look, back when I was growing up, there was CBS, NBC, ABC. It's <laughs> right. gone. Right. I said, in effect, the mainstream is going. Does that shock you, having been so representative of your generation, to feel now like, what the hell am I looking at kind of thing, or no? Um, but you're so young in spirit. I mean that. I'm not just saying that yeah, to blow smoke. Oh, thank really, you. Yeah. you. No, no, that, that's nice. Yeah. But I, I, I like keeping that youth, and I like yeah. keeping an open mind. But an open mind means less restrictions, and these days, um, uh, for good reason yeah. and for good intent, there is a great deal of a closing of the mind. Right. Uh, well, Killers, art, killers walks that line incredibly yeah, because yeah, yeah. it tells the story of a moral injustice, basic, more than a moral injustice, a human injustice, but you still have characters that are wonderfully complicated. Yeah. And, yeah. yeah. And that's, yeah. That's, that's hard to achieve. Well, because, because there isn't such, it, it isn't as simple as suddenly you go into a world that's all morally unjust and everybody's very serious and you know, they're all villains. Right. No. It's the guy next to you. It's you, even. Catholicism was confession. You have mm -hmm. to, examination of conscience, or in Maoist, it was Maoist self-criticism. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Right. But not to be afraid to to to, to criticize yourself. Right. Um, and don't come. Don't become cowed by what other people think. Right. And what they want you to think, I should say. Right. Do you feel like the story around your life and your work, you know, uh, impacted the kind of movies you were making? I don't know. The story of my life was, I guess, wound up in the movies in the mid '70s. That was a little rough period. Pretty rough period till about 78. 76, 78 were pretty tough and came out of it at the end of 78. Mm -hmm. I just embraced myself from where I came from and did this film that De Niro really wanted me to make mm -hmm. over the years, but I had resisted. Mm -hmm. And that was Raging Bull. I think I read that you, you, you hadn't wanted to do it at first. Well, for many different reasons. He saw it sooner than I did. He knew it was me. He knew it was in me, mm -hmm. the Jake LaMotta character that we were making. And so then I felt comfortable. And I realized, oh, I know you didn't what to see do. at first. You no, thought, I was blind because you thought you didn't relate to, or uh... it was first of all we hadn't we hadn't really consolidated the script. And my okay, well, it's a huge story. Yeah, and, uh, and the last thirty minutes are a different movie in a, yeah, an amazing yeah, way. Yeah. yeah, but there were different things. The the relationship with De Niro was changing too because of his stardom. Uh, yeah, and and other things. Do you want to work again uh, with, oh, wow. with him? You know what I'm saying? I had to really oh, yeah, think yeah, about yeah, yeah, that. Yeah. Well, some of the best collaborations happen with, yeah. you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But we went through that period, and we came out the other side, and it was Raging Bull. Right, there you go. So then we did it again in King Comedy. Then I wanted to go off into Last Temptation of Christ to mm -hmm. other films that I wanted, Gangs in New York, things right. like that. And uh, ultimately, when I say embraced where I came from, Raging Bull, was... Uh, you know, it's the 70s, and where I came from, people were still alive. Mm -hmm. My parents were still living down in the tenements. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of the stories I was putting in my movies had elements of truth in them. Mm -hmm. A lot of people down there were still alive, names you couldn't mention. So, yes, yeah, so you're, there's a sensitivity around these. Yeah. yeah. So, I, you know, I was in L.A. I had long hair. I had cowboy <laughs> clothes. I, I loved I saw a picture of you at the Cannes Film Festival recently, and I, I yeah. saw the Marty I met. Yeah, yeah. So, so no, but what happened? I had to grow the beard because I looked so young. Everybody was laughing. Okay, okay, okay. You know, they thought it was twelve years. I said, no, no okay. So okay. I grew a beard. But what I'm getting at is that uh, I couldn't really talk too much or embrace too much my background. But by the right. time I did Raging Bill, I said, the hell with it. Right. And I went back, and my mother and father were in the film, and we right. Yeah, because you started using your mom. Yeah. Using it. Yeah. Was it sim like a, like simply a respectful fear, or more than that? It was a caution. It was a caution. And, okay, and, well and, said. And, and, yes, yes. No, no, a lot of people were still alive. And yeah. It was before the Little Italy became the Little Italy that it is now. Right. It was a closed society. Right. No names mentioned, ever. Right. It's nice yeah. when you come back to the directors, of, there's a dialogue, there's a rapport. Also, on the acting side, you feel like, oh, this guy, this person really likes me because I'm, yes, I'm back again. I'm back. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> and yeah. me out. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it gives you confidence. But you've done that, I mean. Legendarily with De Niro and DiCaprio. Yeah. Well, and we'll do Chanel commercials every three years. Yes, exactly. <laughs> no, but uh, with them, though, it, it's just a different thing because De Niro knew me from Lower East Side when we were 16 years old. Which so he knew insane. the people I grew up with. Right. Still does. Uh, so a few of them left. He was on, with another group uh, up on Kenmare Street. We were okay. on uh, Prince and, and Houston. Okay. Uh, Prince and Houston Street, Elizabeth Mott Mulberry. Mm -hmm. every, every now and then we met in these after hour bars mm -hmm. late at night respectful and always very, very mm -hmm. nice to each other. Some of the guys he was with were I, we didn't like. I miss Mike 
I'm talking about yeah. myself and a couple of my friends. We right. started, you know, stay these away. guys. Stay away. Was he already acting? I couldn't tell. I don't think so. Right. I lost track of him is what happened. Right. And, uh, and, and because Brian De Palma had been working with De Niro in High Mom. Wow. And so they said, you got to meet him. And, and that, after the dinner was over, we were sitting in another room. And, and he looked at me and he says, uh, you used to hang out with Curdy, right? And Joe Morale. And you're with, uh, remember Al Eyes? I said, yeah. He said, I'm Bobby. I said, Bobby? You mean Bobby from Kemi? He says, yeah. Wow. I said, I didn't realize. And that's how we came back that's together. That's how we linked. My God. Yeah. And now you live five blocks from each other or whatever. I don't know. He seems to be around the corner. <laughs> yeah, you see him I can't time. tell. In between roles, he doesn't look, he looks anonymous. I have no idea who he right, is. Right, right. He could be right next to me. He's at B&B Bagels on the line behind you. Yeah. yeah, yeah. You don't know what's yeah. going on. I mean, one night we had dinner with Michael Powell, the great British director, mm -hmm. uh, uh, we were preparing for uh, Raging Bull. He wanted to ask him questions about gaining weight. Uh, there's a sequence that Powell does in his film, Colonel Blimp. I said, well, we'll meet Bob tonight at dinner. And it was an apartment I had on uh, 57th Street. And we're up there eating, and Bob's next to him, and everything's fine. And after the main course, before dessert, he said, I understand uh, De Niro will be coming tonight. I said, he's right next to you. Oh my God! He didn't realize the whole time because he's very quiet and he's sort anonymous, of anonymous. You feel it in his work. You feel someone that's not uh, vain, basically. Yeah, I don't it, know. that's yeah. the key. Yeah, because hey, listen, if the shot plays best on my back and on somebody else's face, play it. Right. Whereas other actors, they need eye light. Right. They need to right, look right, a certain right, right, right. way. He's not talking about me, by the way. <laughs> no, 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 no. He didn't need eye light. <laughs> he didn't need any. Um, and with Leo. Leo are just interesting, a 30-year 30, 30 difference, but he has similar sensibility mm -hmm. and a curiosity. Mm -hmm. Curiosity is the key thing. <sighs> you know. Man, is it ever. That's the biggest thing. And there's a Bob Dylan quote from Chronicles, his book. I might butcher it a little bit, but he says, if your ability to uh, inspire, be curious, or observe is compromised in any way, then your creativity is compromised. That's right. Yeah. And that's the danger of today, too. Yeah. Because yeah. what, there's an answer to everything? Yeah. An answer, and there's a understandably a sensitivity, mm -hmm. you know, which has to be balanced with art somehow, mm -hmm. because uh, the art should be free. I just read for Taxi Driver that there was some like all the directors had come up with some rule or something. I'm going to butcher this too, but that to to be moralistic to not put violence in movies or That's something. Right. Yeah, I still got that. I got that. Oh my God, I, I was I was shunned for Goodfellas. Now why? I was shunned they... in certain Italian restaurants that wouldn't let me in. Would you feel like over the years that perception changed? No, is it, I mean, look, it, it, violence is, a, in ancient Greeks, violence usually took place off stage. And it was described. It was just, <laughs> right, It was right, off stage. Right. A messenger comes in and says, you should see what happened. <laughs> right, 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 right. You should see what they did to, to you know, right. Peleus. He was up there, and <laughs> right. they, 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 they tore him apart in the bakke. Oh, my God. You know. Also helps the fight budget and the stunt budget. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But, um, but it was just as scary and just as disturbing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, highly stylized. I guess I've had this kind of question about violence going all the way back to Mean Streets, mm -hmm. you know. But I grew up in a place that was, you know, violence was a form of expression. Right. And communication. And, yeah, yeah. And it was serious. There was a difference between a, a friendly slap and a slap. Mm -hmm. And that was up to you to determine. You could see that in Goodfellas when he says, well, you think I'm funny? Was that scripted? No. Yeah, that wasn't scripted. No, it's something, right. something happened to Joe in his life. <laughs> And he scary, told me, man. and he said he got himself out of it. He got him by saying, Oh, so he was on the opposite side of that situation. Says, yeah, you're screwing oh, with God. me. You're oh, screwing God. with me. The guy said, I had you there, you bastard. Oh, I had you. You know? And I said, that's the story. It wasn't even the script. We put it in. That reminds me when I was in middle school on 108th in Amsterdam, and uh, I saw one of my good friends, Jordan, the week before. Someone said to him, uh, he got in basically a tussle and an argument with a guy. And uh, he said to the guy, oh, you're so tough. Punch me in the face. And he leaned in. And the other guy was terrified and he backed down. So, you know, a week later, I was getting hassled by some kids. And I leaned into the guy and said, You're so tough, punch me in the face. And I got punched one of the few punched. times in my life. I got punched so bad. That really hurts. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> that really it was one of the few times in my life I got really rocked in the face. It's a good yeah. lesson, though. Yeah, no, I, I, uh, I, I found luckily I had the asthma because they would leave <laughs> me alone. They're some of the toughest guys. They would fool you around and get mad at you and then say, No, it's all right, the kid's sick. And they would take, yeah, come here. And they would take care of me. <laughs> oh, I love in the, uh, in the, in the uh, spot when you say, well, I'd be kinder to myself. And, Wait, yeah. I haven't seen I don't remember that. This it's must in be the new now. version. Yeah, we put the new. Anyway, thank you. Thanks for letting me chat like this. Oh, and, thanks. Can we settle? We're just getting the last lines right here. And we're ending.
Hey, you guys settled or what? It can't be that bad. <laughs> Are you guys just trying to get He's the good looking. What are you talking about? <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> yeah. Is that one on He's me? He's a big no? deal, this kid. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, guys. This is take two. Let's see how sincere this is. Thanks yes. again. Thanks again for chatting about. Well, working. thank you. Thank yeah. you, Timothy. And uh, I guess I'll see you later, right? I'll see you tonight. Okay. We'll celebrate this. Terrific.